First of all, a huge thank you to everybody who followed the Dragon Prince reaction series. For all the comments, for all the discussions, for all the likes, I really appreciate it. It would not have been anywhere near as enjoyable without you guys. It was a show that I really looked forward to, and it was especially interesting watching it alongside Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood because that show is so heavy and so intense. It felt like a breath of fresh air, like I could just enjoy it, which was great. Um, but yeah, so today's the Q&A. Let's just get into the questions. Zach asks, with Aaron, he has his... he has his... Emphasis on character-driven storytelling. Is there anything you think he did better in Dragon Prince compared to Avatar or vice versa? So one thing I think I enjoy more about Dragon Prince than Avatar is I think that Viren as a villain is done incredibly well. I think one of my criticisms of Avatar the first time I watched it was that Ozai himself is not really someone that's that involved in the story. I mean, I think the best development for Ozai is basically how sinister he is in light of what he does to Zuko and how he treats Azula. But Varen is someone you really enjoy watching. Like, he's a really big and active part of the show. And it's such a delight. Like, I think he's one of my favorite parts of the show, to be sure. You're like, yeah, this is terrible, but I can kind of see where he's coming from. I can kind of see what he's trying to accomplish. I understand the temptation he's facing to use dark magic or to gain power in order to do things that help humanity. I think it's some of the best villain writing I've ever seen. On the other hand, I think there are a lot of things that Avatar did really well where Dragon Prince sort of fell short. As you know, I'm watching The Last Airbender again right now. One thing I've come to appreciate, even early on in the first season, is that episodes do so many things at once. They build the characters, they build the overall story, but they're also self-contained stories. Like you get a whole thematic arc in, in one episode. Not always, but in a lot of episodes. A good example of this, I think, is one of my favorite episodes, The Deserter with Zhang Zhang. We get Aang starting to learn fire. Zhang Zhang becomes important later for the overall story, but also you sort of have this whole self-contained arc with Zhang Zhang and like the questions of what is the nature of power? You know, is power itself bad? Should you hide from your own strength, right? The challenge for Zhang Zhang and also for Aang is learning that power has responsibility and that power has great costs, but also great benefits. And it's not about one or the other, it's about them being in balance. And that's such a cool idea. And that happens in the span of like 25 minutes. Dragon Prince, on the other hand, I think could have used more of that. I think episodes sometimes feel a little bit out of focus. Like they all connect to the larger plot in some way, right? They're, it's all about their journey. And there's always some character development. I mean, there are definitely examples of this, but I feel like it's less often that the episodes themselves and the journey they're on and the specifics of their journey that day or whatever actually contain like a larger theme. I also think Avatar does a little bit of a better job having crystal clear focus on the characters and giving them a range of different personality types. I think a lot of the last Airbender characters, they have certain qualities that we get to see at two extremes. We get to see the, the great applications of it and we get to see the not so great applications of it. You know, like thinking about Katara, she's very courageous and very principled. And we get to see the good side of that, which is that she stands up for people and she actually makes significant changes in the place she visits. On the other hand, she can be sort of rash and impulsive. That sometimes creates conflict and brings people down. And Sokka is incredibly intelligent and his intelligence can be used for great things like science and strategy. But the downside of that is that he can be a little bit cynical he can be a little bit bitter. I think with the Dragon Prince characters, we don't really see as much of that range, or it doesn't feel as cohesive as traits all put together. JD the Butt asks, what is your favorite Arcanum so far? What type of elf would you like to be? What is your favorite dragon in the series so far? Favorite Arcanum? Let's say Star. Yeah, the stars. You can't go wrong with the stars. First of all, I got Aravos, who's awesome. Second of all, out of all the things, like, Stars just seem the most epic and amazing. Stars have life for me in a way that these other elements don't. So to answer your second question, not surprisingly, I'm gonna go with Star Touch Elves. I prefer not to be trapped in a mirror if I can help it, but you know, maybe I could just cocoon myself out of it. That might be all right. And favorite dragon, without a doubt, it's the Dragon King. I don't know his name. I'm never gonna learn his name, but he's awesome. Literally every episode I watched of the Dragon Prince, I did the thing with him. Thrax Stormbringer asks, do you think the shift to a somewhat darker tone this season benefited the show? So this is tricky because I think that darkness itself is not really an enhancer of a show, but I think there's a certain minimum level of darkness that it can be helpful to reach just so the audience knows that real things can happen and that there are stakes. So just the fact that we see people die I think adds a nice little something just knowing like, oh, bad things can happen. You know, it's not going to be censored for a certain audience. Once you reach that threshold, then it's just about like, how well does it suit the story and how dramatic is it? The Soren thing, I think actually was a little bit jarring. I mean, it was very exciting, but it was, it was just weird, you know, to see that happen. Because Soren is such a lovable and goofy character. Seeing him stab Viren was, it was bizarre. I think one way the show does darkness really well is not in the violence, but in the characters, right? Like some of their, their thinking and motivation is just so dark, but in the sweetest way, like you know exactly how they got there, you know? Like the temptation from Aravos is so dark, but also so rich because you're like, yeah, that sounds fun, you know? Drink the potion, cut yourself or whatever. Soren Monroe asks, the question is really random, but after that one episode in season two where Rayla and Soren were fighting, I was shipping them. How do you think their romance would have played out? I feel like the romance could have worked. You know, it could work, but honestly, I don't see Soren as a very serious boyfriend. <laughs> so it definitely would be different from Callum. You know, Callum is really, really into it. Soren and Rayla, I feel like would have been a little bit more casual. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what I mean? On Rayla's side too, for that matter. I think that Rayla would be attracted to Soren, and they have a lot of mutual interests, but I think it would fall apart beyond that. I feel like Rayla is somebody who would like conversation, and would like to have a mental peer, not just a physical peer, and... Soren's poetry is not going to cut it. Colton Baggett asks, How do you feel about Raylam? Do you think it was rushed or not? I'm sort of indifferent to it. I don't think it was rushed necessarily. I mean, I think that their relationship made a lot of sense the way we saw it play out. Like, they spent every day together on this crazy journey. They had a common goal. They went through a lot of stuff and helped each other out and grew in the process. They're compatible in terms of their, just their thinking, their talking, their interests. They have just enough differences with each other to make it intriguing for each of them. And then Callum saves her from self-sacrifice for the dragon, incurs a terrible cost to his own soul, and you see Rayla sort of transform in that moment to realizing that maybe she was taking him for granted a little bit, or at least the realization that she owed him a lot of gratitude. And so she nursed him back to health, developed feelings, and then shortly after that, they get together. So that felt fine to me. If I have any problem with Raylam, it's, as I've said in videos, I sort of have an issue with the way Callum approaches it. And this is not a, even a writing or character criticism. It's like a human criticism, you know what I mean? Like, if I was his friend or his older brother or something, and he came to me to ask me for relationship advice about Rayla, I'd be like, dude, back off. Just a little bit. Like, just be strong be there for her. You don't want to become overly emotional to match her emotional state. And that's just me. I mean, from comments, I've seen that a lot of people have different experiences where actually being really, really concerned for someone else's emotions like that, or being really awkward in certain moments, isn't necessarily a deal breaker for relationships. And sometimes it works out anyway. But just me, you know, like my experience, I feel like non-romantically, when I'm in a bad state, I'm not looking for someone to join my emotional state. I'm looking for someone who's above my emotional state so I can sort of like average out with them and become stronger. And I've also found that when I'm trying to support people, the best thing I can do is not try to make them feel better, but actually just be myself and treat them with kindness and treat them as I would normally treat them because I feel like that sometimes grabs people out of their funk. You know, it grabs people out of their state and they can feel like there's there's something normal and something they can rely on. That's just the way I think. It's not necessarily the whole story or the whole truth. Callum, I felt, was like just dripping with emotions all the time. He just exudes anxiety. And for me, that's counterproductive to a relationship. And I think a choice they made with Rayla, which is not a bad thing necessarily, it's just a, a choice that they made, was that she's very receptive to that. And I think a lot of people maybe wouldn't be. Aruj Qureshi asks, what parallels do you see between the show and Avatar? Do you think King Harrow is alive? Where do you think the show can go from here? A lot of, some big questions. Parallels, it's hard to even cover all of them because there are just so many. Some of it is just parallels for hero journeys in general, right? Like you're living a peaceful life and then a challenge happens. There's a call to adventure. You accept the call, you go out, you grow, you meet the villain, etc. So both Avatar and Dragon Prince contain those elements. More specifically to these two shows, one of the biggest ones that comes to mind is the evil father and the, the brother and sister kid, right? You have Viren Ozai and below that you have Sorin, Zuko, Azula, Claudia. I probably mixed up that order, but whatever. And that's especially obvious at the end of season three, right? Claudia is going the Azula route, Soren is going the Zuko route. Other parallels are the lore, just having a world full of different kinds of magic, and having us as the audience follow along with the characters as they learn what those things are and as they increase their abilities. You also have a lot of characters dealing with loss. You have the focus on animal guides. You have different nations that have conflicting interests. You have a focus on humor. There are a lot of things. I mean, in many ways, they feel like parallel shows. Do I think King Harrow is alive? I did think so, you know? I didn't think about this while watching, but while I was editing the video, where King Harrow talks to the bird. And I remembered the Twin Fang Serpent, and I'm like, maybe he's the bird. But since then, I've been informed, and I'm assuming this is true, that they initially planned for King Harrow's soul to be in the parrot, but changed their minds. Similar to what happened in Avatar The Last Airbender, speaking of parallels, with Momo originally being, I think it was Roku. Honestly, I think it's probably a good choice not to have done that, because I think that it would be sort of unfair to the audience to make us sort of grieve over Harrow through Callum and Ezrin, and then be like, He's still alive. In fact, that's sort of how I feel right now, having read the comic and seeing the ending with Rayla and her parents. It's like hard to connect with it, knowing that Rayla's parents are probably coins and will be brought back. And where do I think the show can go from here? This is a really tough challenge. Um, I talked about this a little bit in episode 9. I think they're going to have to reboot it in some ways. You know, we still have the overarching villain. We have Viren, and worse, we have Erebos. So that, I think, is going to be the main thread always, thankfully, because I think that's a really cool thing to focus on. But I think we need to have new challenges, sort of new arcs for the characters to continue the adventure, because we've already brought the Dragon Prince to his mother. Zim has kind of outlived his purpose in terms of pushing the narrative forward. So we're going to need something new. And there's a bunch of places that could come from. It could come from conflict with the elves. It could come from competing factions that we haven't even thought of yet, right? Because not all the elves are going to be on the same page. There could be third third and fourth parties entering that we, we don't know anything about. One arc I think they're definitely going to explore that I'm looking forward to is Ezrin developing as king. That's going to be really cool. And it seems like at the end of the comic, 
Rayla is on her own solo adventure, so it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Beyond that, I don't really have that many predictions. I think that, you know, it's possible that they themselves, the, the writers, aren't even completely sure yet. Maybe by this point they're sure, having started season four, but I think that because they borrowed so many elements from their final vision to finish season three, they're gonna have to fill in a lot of the gaps with new ideas. Eric Palacios asks, who are your favorite characters from the Dragon Prince so far? Uh, obviously Soren. I've been a fan of Soren since day one. I felt like his humor was some of the most consistent humor. I think his story is some of the most compelling stuff for me personally. I think he has some really great traits and also we both struggle with names and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate being represented like that in a show. As someone who could never get anything, anyone's name right or any location name right, having Soren speak for me, oh, it was beautiful. Aside from Soren, I'm gonna say Viren. Aravos as a combo. Viren was always cool, and I probably would have listed him even before Aravos or without Aravos, but adding Aravos just took it to the next level. They're so compelling together. They're so exciting because you know exactly the path Viren is on, and you simultaneously are worried for him and think he's a villain and want him to go farther. You know, like it's so great. And Aravos is so cunning. Like, I think one of the coolest things for me about Aravos was realizing that as powerful as he is in dark magic, I really am convinced that most of his power just comes from a basic understanding of psychology. Like he's so good at leading people along through words and suggestions. And then in third place, I'm gonna say Ezrin. Ezrin, you know, he doesn't really have as much fluctuation character-wise, and that works because he's just so good. He's just such a great kid and you root for him. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body, but it's done in a way that doesn't feel obnoxious. Adam Connolly asks, do you think Claudia should be redeemed or left as a villain? Personally, I like redemption. And I think it would be more complicated and harder work for the writing, but also more satisfying if they find a way to redeem her after everything she has done and will certainly do in the future. In fact, one of the things I feel like is still left hanging for me from The Last Airbender is what happens to Azula? Like, that was really the question I posed when I started reading the comics, and I assumed that's where they were going. And there was one comic, I think it was Smoke and Shadows, that hinted at some progression, but we never really got the end of the story for Azula. And I think it would have been so amazing if they could have pulled that off, you know? So I'm going to say that for Claudia, I want her to be redeemed, but I want it to be authentic. I don't want the complexities of what she's done and what she will do to be glossed over. Andrew Burton asks, what do you think about the dragon speaking in the third season? Did you think it was cool or did you prefer it in the first two seasons when they didn't speak? I didn't even notice that. I didn't realize that speaking was a later introduction. I like it because it makes them more relatable characters. I appreciate good dialogue, and I'm convinced that the purpose of stories, even fantasy stories, is to derive value as a human being. And so to anthropomorphize the dragons in that way, it adds a little more humanity to them that I think makes them more interesting characters. I think the most notable example of this is when King Harrow and Viren kill the dragon king because he talks about sparing them, right? Which adds something to his character. You see that he's excited or he has duty towards his his new son and he's willing to show mercy and so it makes that scene a little bit more tragic. So overall I think it was a good choice. Jose Luis Garcia asks, after reading Through the Moon, what do you expect or what would you like to see in season four? One thing based on the comic that I think would be cool is I want to see what the Rayla solo adventure looks like because we've gotten a lot of her in Callum. I think it would be interesting now to take the characters and put them in different contexts and with different people and to see the dynamics. I think that could grow their characters a little bit. Popcorn Crash asks, what did you think of the cliffhanger at the end of the show with Claudia and Viren? So I didn't realize when watching that you see a corpse that Claudia maybe used to bring Viren back. That paints a very dark picture for her, but I think it's an interesting choice. Um, and I think it's, it was a good choice. Viren, man, I don't know what to think about him. I don't know what to think about his direction. I think that there's a possibility that Viren maybe will have some redemption too. Unlikely, unlikely, but it would be cool. It would be cool to see them attempt that. I would respect the, the bravery of trying that. Antavius Mitchell asks, did you find comedy dragging at times? If so, any notable moments? Definitely. I think this got better actually later on. There were some scenes that seemed to have no purpose other than comedy. I'm trying to think of examples, but it's been a while. I think one disappointing element of comedy was Claudia and Soren while they were traveling together. I think it was a matter of like when expectations meet reality, you know, because I was so interested in Claudia and Soren. But for a while, or at least for a couple episodes, the interactions that we got between them were just humor. And I didn't find it like extremely funny. Although there are some moments that I won't say were good, but were certainly memorable. Like it wasn't the horse, right? I'll never forget that, unfortunately. I think a bigger complaint for me, comedy wise, was that a lot of characters seem to have the same type of comedy despite their characters. I can't remember the joke exactly, but I remember thinking this for one of the Sunfire Elves. She makes a joke that is very similar to like how Callum would make a joke, and so to me that breaks the fourth wall because it's like this is the writer's style of joking. I also found Callum's humor difficult at times because it's sort of like, look at me, I'm quirky and goofy. Not to be too negative, I think there were a lot of comedy successes, and I think most notable for me is Soren, who just consistently made me laugh. I mean, I know I sound like a Soren fanboy at this point, it's because I am, but like I'm still like laughing at 
you got to butter them up. I don't know what it was about that. It was amazing. And the hay, the whole hay gag was great. Speaking of it wasn't the horse, Claudia has some great moments too, but in, a, in an interesting way. It's like, it just pushes you. It pushes the joke so far that it becomes funny again. When she's talking to Varen and she tells him that Soren's on the toilet and Varen's like, you don't need to paint me a picture. <laughs> she says, I would only need one color for that picture. Brown, you know, it's like it really runs it into the ground, but in a way that personally I appreciate. Game Ninja asks, would you like there to be a time skip in book four? I think there's a lot of things they could do with that. I think that a time skip would be especially useful for them if they are doing what I suspect they're doing, which is rebooting certain things, you know, rebooting certain elements of the story. If that's true, I think there is a lot of potential in not showing us the daily reality of getting through things to get to that arc but rather just quickly catching us up and then jumping into it. Kelly DePaz asks, what do you think Erevos and Varian's dynamic will be like going forward? And what are some pros and cons you have with the show? So about Erevos and Varian, I think that at this point, Erevos is like a drug or it's like an addiction. When you start getting addicted to something, it's fun. And you don't realize how addicted you are to it until you try to backtrack. Like in the beginning, you tell yourself you can quit anytime. And then one day you're like, well, it's time and you can't quit. And you're like, crap, and then you're in too deep. So far, everything that Erevos has helped Viren with is something that Viren desired on some level, but it's going to cross a line real soon. And I think one of those potential lines is Claudia. And it's very likely that when that happens, Viren is going to try to distance himself from Erevos, but it's going to be way too late because at this point he has two silk eyes and three insect walkie-talkies or whatever. And so in that light, speaking it out loud, I think there's a potential that Viren and Erevos becomes enemies, which is kind of cool to think about. It's either that or Viren just totally succumbs and becomes a puppet of Erevos. Which also would be fun, but maybe not as fun. <laughs> Game Ninja asks, favorite ship in the show? Uh, man. Well, as you might have guessed, it's not Raylum. You know what? I'm gonna say Varen Aravos, because why not? <laughs> why not? I mean, they're such a cool dynamic. I don't need there to be romance there, but I think that would be cool just because it's so bizarre, their relationship already. Like, adding romance is like, what the hell? You know? So just for the hell of it. I'm going to go with Erevos and Varen. Another one I think that actually would work really well, and this is just like way in the future just because of, of their ages, is Ezra and Anya. Because I think it would be really cool to see Ezra as like an adult king being as awesome as he is with Anya as an adult queen as awesome as she is. That would be cool. Queenie Dragon asks, what are you most curious about in terms of the Dragon Prince lore? One thing is, I've just grown intrigued by the Star Touch elves. We have Erevos as an example. To think that there's more behind that is kind of a cool thought. I'm also curious about the origins of human use of magic. I've heard different things about this. I've heard that humans have used magic in the past, but to us, Callum is the first human that uses magic. From the show, I was thinking that dark magic was the way humanity got out of living in a terrible state of existence, but I've also seen it suggested through extended literature that the unicorns helped humans gather magic, so I think clearly defining that would be more interesting because I think that adds something thematic. Like in Korra, when I really enjoyed the Wan backstory, even though that's controversial, I think there are cool things you can do with the origin of humanity in stories and its development. Weevil asks, I have heard people mention Ezla, Ezrin and Rayla, what do you think about that? All right, this is gonna be controversial. <laughs> I mean, Ezrin's a child, so it doesn't work now. I honestly think adult Ezrin and Rayla, I would like better than Rayla Callum. <laughs> Ezrin is not ready to eat sandwiches yet, but he's already a man. Just my lens on relationships and romance. That concept works for me than Callum, who in, in many ways is very boyish. Patrick Gensch asks, what is your favorite episode? I don't think I could pick just one. So some of the episodes I liked were the flashback episode where we see them take down the Titan and Callum reads the letter. I think that's one of the examples where it's one episode that does everything. Like it builds the world, it builds the characters and also provides a very nice theme to think about, which is about like, cycles of violence and not perpetuating the past and choosing your own future and how you view history, right? All that was so interesting. I also really, really love season three, episode seven, because man, so much happens in that episode. Viren takes over an entire elf kingdom in the most awesome way possible. We get like a new framing for Amaya being with the elves. Callum, really and Ezrin just climb a mountain. but And we also start to see Soren and Claudia's conflict a little bit in that episode, right? They watched Viren decimate this entire place and Soren's like ooh, right timothy mignol asks what do you think about the quality of characters and character building i think it's good i think it could be better the way it's good is that the characters feel very distinct and they feel very real and they are flawed like in the last airbender and they learn and they grow so i think at its highs the character building is incredible one way i think it falls a little bit flat for me character wise just you know in general and again this is my particular lens on things my hope for watching shows like this is that the characters will embody inspirational qualities. And that doesn't mean they have to be perfect. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's great when characters are flawed, but I think the journey has to include them overcoming their flaws and growing as a result of that. And the characters certainly do that, but I think sometimes that focus is lost. And the way I pointed this out in the show and the way this is most relevant to me is with Callum. Callum sort of gets knocked around a lot. I feel like they forget the fact that he's 
one of the heroes of the story. He has moments like that where he like battles the darkness inside him and he deeply considers the words of his father, King Harrow, and strives to be a better person, a better brother, right? All that's great. But then you have episodes where he's just like, the whole time he's falling off a horse or falling down, not knowing how to climb a rope, you know? So those kinds of things, I lose some esteem for the characters a little bit, at least in that moment. Now there might be a payoff for that, right? Like if Callum ends up being just super capable and like focuses head on on the idea of like, why can't I just simply ride a horse? Then that would be great and I would reverse my thinking about that. But my feeling about it is that sometimes these things are played for humor and the humor sort of undermines the characters. Overall feeling on animation quality after hearing negative reviews of it coming in. I noticed it in season one, it did not bother me at all. Would you put this on the list of being rewatchable? Yes, and in fact, I probably will rewatch it right before season four comes out, just to, you know, get myself ready for it. Narendra NP asks, is it possible for a human and elf to have a baby? That is the burning question on everyone's minds. Speaking of lore, speaking of lore that I need to know, can humans and elves have kids? Mariana Lopez asks, what are some of the side characters you would like to see being more explored in book four? Hi, Mariana. I'll tell you who I don't want to see more of, Lu Jane. I think I've had enough of her. Does Amaya count as a side character? Because if so, I would love to see more Amaya. Anya, I think Anya's really cool. I would love to see her grow as a queen and become involved in the story. Gwen is cool. Bring Gwen along with Amaya. I like Gwen. Gay Ninja asks, favorite things and least favorite things about the show? Some of the bigger themes I think are really great. Like, I love how compelling the message was about cycles of violence. I think that they conveyed that really, really well. I love that it brings interesting challenges about, like, pragmatism and idealism. What are the costs of helping people? That really excited me. And also the humor. I mean, I think it doesn't always land, but when it works, it really, really works. I also think Amaya. Amaya is a great character, and I think having her do sign language was a really great touch. It's something I can't remember seeing before, but it was done really well. Least favorite things is that sometimes I think some of the plots in the episodes are a little bit meandering and unfocused. An example I have of that is when Ezrin ascends to the throne, and it's so interesting seeing what he has to deal with, but then on the other side of that you have like Rayla and Callum playing with flowers, you know? I also think that some of the journeys the character's on, some of their emotional crises, are kind of obvious to us, and so it's sort of hard to get behind it. Like, for example, Rayla and her parents, right? Like, I knew from the very minute I saw it that Rayla's parents hadn't fled. So her reaction, not only did it seem extreme, you know, it's hard to sink into it when you know it's not true. Also, this might be really controversial, but one of my least favorite parts of the show is Zim. Zim is just a little bit too cute and puppy-like. It ends up having the reverse effect on me that I think is intended. He's supposed to be endearing, but like he's a dragon, man. Like he should be cool. And you know I love animals, right? Like you guys know I love animals, but I feel like he's he's a husk. He's just like this happy husk. I don't really feel anything like special from him. Bait, on the other hand, is incredible. Like I didn't like Bait much at first or I just didn't think about him that much, but like Bait has some great moments. And I actually felt like really terrible for him when Ezra was ignoring him. So, you know, I know they can do animals well, but Zim just, he doesn't have that. He doesn't have that dynamism. And another thing, as I've already talked about a little bit, is that Callum, I think, needs to, like, have a little more edge. Like, he's a little bit too dopey. And sometimes that gets to me. You know, sometimes I forget why I'm rooting for him. Just stop playing up his inadequacy for humor so much, you know? Ruins of Xerxes. Is that a Full Metal Alchemist reference? Nice. And you have Appa Avatar, too. How do you feel knowing that characters like Lu Jane <laughs> exist in the real world, especially as advisors, teachers, and mentors to vulnerable minds? Not good. <laughs> <laughs> Not great. It's unfortunate. Although I think one positive thing about that is Lu Jane seems like her philosophy is weird. It seems like she's out to deliberately mislead people because of some connection to the moon or magic. I don't think most people are deliberately setting out to be misleading. I just think that mediocrity is sort of a dominant force in the world. And, you know, I'm I'm an optimist when it comes to humans. I believe people generally do their best. And you gotta have forgiveness for that. But Lu Jane is like, it's deliberate. It's deliberate and it feels disconnected from things that I understand. You know, like, there's no moon arcanum. You know, so what is the real world application of it? Just lying all the time. For what? You know, I don't know. I didn't really get it. I didn't connect with it. And least compelling major character of Dragon Prince? If Zim counts, it's Zim. Magordam asks, would you recommend Dragon Prince? I think I would, but I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. I think I would recommend it to people who are interested in this genre, like people who like fantasy things. I would definitely recommend it to anybody I knew who enjoyed Avatar. Redtail asks, who do you think is superior, Elf Callum or Human Rayla? 100% Human Rayla. Elf Callum was such an embarrassment. You know what? I've been I've been speaking really poorly of Callum. Maybe that's when it all started. He really let me down. He let me down so bad with Elf Callum. Human Rayla cut to the bone. Like I was 
I was offended. I felt like she was attacking me. So Elf Callum for me represented all my hopes and dreams of, of vengeance. And he just fell flat on his face. Like there was nothing good that came out of Elf Callum. And then he wore those stupid leaves in his head. It just no, it wasn't good. I did not enjoy Elf Callum. Human Rela was fantastic. I mean, I, I would be fine if she was like a regular character. Richelle and Javier asks, what is the best sore in one liner? You gotta butter them up is my favorite. I love that. Also, his haikus are great. I love his haikus. Asher1347 asks, I really appreciate how the series represents same-sex relationships without making a point of it. While I also appreciate that you seem to have the same approach, I'm curious if you have thoughts on it. So one thing that stood out to me about this was Anya's parents. I thought that was really cool because I can't remember ever having seen two queens in media before. Other than that, it's not something that I really think about. I mean, I think what's more important to me is not necessarily the representation of, of these things, but more like, does it feel genuine? Does it feel organic? And does it help the story? And so I'll give a counter example of that, which is Amaya and the and the elf, right? That kind of happened a little bit quickly. I mean, that's not an issue of sex, same sex relationships. It's more like my issue with just their relationship feeling rushed. Nero and Evo's brother asks, who do you think the best warrior is? If it's Soren, why? It's Soren. Well, who else would it be? I think Rayla is the other contender for that. And I think Sorin beat Rayla in their last encounter. So Sorin's up one right now. Rayla can maybe reclaim it. But I will say that Rayla is a beast athlete. Like, seeing what she can do is incredible. Data Aditya asks, What is your least favorite plot thread of the show so far and why? Zim. Zim feels flat to me. I don't really care about him as a dragon. I hope I eat my words, and I hope that Zim grows up to be the most awesome, badass dragon ever. I would love that. If that doesn't count, I'll say Rayla's parents. Just because... It's unsatisfying watching her struggle with that, with us strongly inferring that they're coins and they're gonna come back. And her guilt about the Dragon Guard too, before the resolution to that. Similarly, because I just knew that that wasn't what happened, so. Music Guy asks, Aravos said he never lies. Do you think that's true? I wouldn't trust anything he said, but I also think he doesn't need to lie. He's just really, he's that good. He's very compelling. By Alessio Freitas asks, who do you think Callum's father is? I have no idea. I never thought about that. Is there a connection there? What if it's Viren? No, I don't know. <laughs> Who do you think will die in future seasons? Viren? Good chance, Viren. There's a chance Sorn will die. Although I doubt it. Who knows? Who knows? I hope Lujain dies. Do you think we'll see a fight between the first human mage, Callum, and the master of all six primal sources, Erebos? And who will win? Callum will win out eventually, because that's the story, right? That's just the arc that it has to go on. But I could imagine them meeting earlier and battling and Callum losing and having to learn from that experience. That seems possible. Avtar Gotra asks, what is your favorite season? I gotta go season three. It's just so action-packed and we get a lot of important character stuff. But season two is really close behind. It's a sort of a toss-up for me. Mikhail asks, so according to you, is Viren a bad guy and why? Interesting. The answer for me is a very clear yes, and I'll give you the best reason possible. He kicked bait. You don't kick a helpless animal. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. Um, yeah, he's a bad guy. I think that the sum of his actions, so far from what we've seen, have been bad. I think that he started out with principles, and I don't think that those principles were evil, I just think it was ignorance. I think it was a mistaken understanding of the world and the way it works. But I think as the show goes on, it becomes more clear that he's willing to do anything he, he can. And I think that at this point, he sort of lost it. He sort of lost touch with his base, his morals. And I think a big indication of that is how he treats his kids. Mel Wife asks, I want to know what you think of Nick's remarking Zim has his mom's eyes when he clearly does not. Nyx was sort of weird. She's another character they can go. <laughs> Mushi the Tea Maker asks, will you come back to watch The Dragon Prince when the new seasons are released? Absolutely. My hope is that as soon as season four comes out, I can do reaction videos. Part of it will depend on what else is going on at that time, because who knows when it'll be. If I have enough time to make and edit the videos, they're going to come out right away. Amonra2000 asks, Dragon Prince question, who do you think will be the final boss of the show? I think what they'll probably end up doing is something similar to Avatar, where it's multiple final bosses, and it's not one or the other, and they maybe happen simultaneously. Like in the final couple episodes of The Last Airbender, we have Aang versus Ozai, and we have Katara and Zuko versus Azula. I'm guessing something similar like that will happen. You can imagine like Soren Viren, Callum Aravos, and Rayla Claudia, does that make sense? I don't know, something like that. All right, and on that note, that is the end of the Q&A. Thank you to everyone for all the amazing questions. Thank you for following the series. If you haven't heard, Attack on Titan will be the next show concurrently with Full Metal Alchemist, so I hope to see you guys for that. And otherwise, if you are only a Dragon Prince fan, wish you guys the best and I'll see you back for season four. <laughs>